Chapter 6 A Dawning Light The three detectives had many matters of detail into which to inquire, so I returned alone to our modest quarters at the village inn. But before doing so I took a stroll in the curious old-world garden which flanked the house. Rows of very ancient yew-trees cut into strange designs girded it around. Inside was a beautiful stretch of lawn with an old sundial in the middle, the whole effect so soothing and restful that it was welcome to my somewhat jangled nerves. In that deeply peaceful atmosphere one could forget, or remember only as some fantastic nightmare, that darkened study with the sprawling, blood-stained figure on the floor. And yet, as I strolled round it and tried to steep my soul in its gentle balm, a strange incident occurred which brought me back to the tragedy and left a sinister impression in my mind. I have said that a decoration of yew-trees circled the garden. At the end farthest from the house they thickened into a continuous hedge. On the other side of this hedge, concealed from the eyes of anyone approaching from the direction of the house, there was a stone seat. As I approached the spot I was aware of voices, some remark in the deep tones of a man answered by a little ripple of feminine laughter. An instant later I had come round the end of the hedge, and my eyes lit upon Mrs. Douglas and the man Barker before they were aware of my presence. Her appearance gave me a shock. In the dining-room she had been demure and discreet. Now all pretense of grief had passed away from her. Her eyes shone with the joy of living and her face still quivered with amusement at some remark of her companion. He sat forward, his hands clasped and his forearms on his knees, with an answering smile upon his bold, handsome face. In an instant, but it was just one instant too late, they resumed their solemn masks as my figure came into view. A hurried word or two passed between them, and then Barker rose and came towards me. "'Excuse me, sir,' said he, but am I addressing Dr. Watson?" I bowed with a coldness which showed, I dare say, very plainly the impression which had been produced upon my mind. "'We thought that it was probably you, as your friendship with Mr. Sherlock Holmes is so well known. Would you mind coming over and speaking to Mrs. Douglas for one instant?' I followed him with a dour face. Very clearly I could see in my mind's eye that that shattered figure on the floor here within a few hours of the tragedy were his wife and his nearest friend laughing together behind a bush in the garden which had been his. I greeted the lady with reserve. I had grieved with her grief in the dining-room. Now I met her appealing gaze with an unresponsive eye. "'I fear that you think me callous and hard-hearted,' said she. I shrugged my shoulders. "'It is no business of mine,' said I. "'Perhaps some day you will do me justice, if you only realised. "'There's no need why Dr. Watson should realise, said Barker quickly. "'As he has himself said, it is no possible business of his.' "'Exactly,' said I, and so I will beg leave to resume my walk. "'One moment, Dr. Watson,' cried the woman in a pleading voice. "'There is one question which you can answer with more authority than anyone else in the world.' and it may make a very great difference to me. You know Mr. Holmes and his relations with the police better than anyone else can. Supposing that a matter were brought confidentially to his knowledge, is it absolutely necessary that he should pass it on to the detectives? Yes, that's it, said Barker eagerly. Is he on his own, or is he entirely in with them? I really don't know that I should be justified in discussing that point. I beg, I implore that you will, Dr. Watson. I assure you that you will be helping us, helping me greatly, if you will guide us on that point." There was such a ring of sincerity in the woman's voice that for the instant I forgot all about her levity and was moved only to do her will. "'Mr. Holmes is an independent investigator,' I said. He is his own master, and would act as his own judgment directed. At the same time he would naturally feel loyalty towards the officials who were working on the same case, and he would not conceal from them anything which would help them in bringing a criminal to justice. Beyond this I can say nothing, and I would refer you to Mr. Holmes himself if you wanted fuller information." So saying I raised my hat and went upon my way.
leaving them still seated behind that concealing hedge. I looked back as I rounded the far end of it, and saw that they were still talking very earnestly together, and as they were gazing after me it was clear that it was our interview that was the subject of their debate. "'I wish none of their confidences,' said Holmes, when I reported to him what had occurred. He had spent the whole afternoon at the manor-house in consultation with his two colleagues, and returned about five with a ravenous appetite for a high tea which I had ordered for him. "'No confidences, Watson, for they are mighty awkward if it comes to an arrest for conspiracy and murder. You think it'll come to that?' He was in his most cheerful and debonair humour. "'My dear Watson, when I have exterminated that fourth egg, I shall be ready to put you in touch with the whole situation. I don't say that we have fathomed it, far from it, but when we have traced the missing dumbbell, the dumbbell, dear me, Watson, is it possible that you have not penetrated the fact that the case hangs upon the missing dumbbell? Well, well, you need not be downcast, for between ourselves I don't think that either Inspector Mack or the excellent local practitioner has grasped the overwhelming importance of this incident. One dumbbell, Watson, Consider an athlete with one dumbbell. Picture to yourself the unilateral development, the imminent danger of a spinal curvature. Shocking, Watson! Shocking! He sat with his mouth full of toast and his eyes sparkling with mischief, watching my intellectual entanglement. The mere sight of his excellent appetite was an assurance of success for I had very clear recollections of days and nights without a thought of food when his baffled mind had chafed before some problem, while his thin, eager features became more attenuated with the asceticism of complete mental concentration. Finally, he lit his pipe, and sitting in the ingle-nook of the old village inn, he talked slowly and at random about his case, rather as one who thinks aloud than as one who makes a considered statement. A lie, Watson, a great, big, thumping, obtrusive, uncompromising lie. That's what meets us on the threshold. There is our starting point. The whole story told by Barker is a lie. But Barker's story is corroborated by Mrs. Douglas. Therefore, she is lying also. They are both lying, and in a conspiracy. So now we have the clear problem. Why are they lying, and what is the truth which they are trying so hard to conceal? Let us try, Watson, you and I, if we can get behind the lie and reconstruct the truth. How do I know that they are lying? Because it is a clumsy fabrication which simply could not be true. Consider, according to the story given to us, the assassin had less than a minute after the murder had been committed to take that ring, which was under another ring from the dead man's finger, to replace the other ring, a thing which he would surely never have done, and to put that singular card beside his victim. I say that this was obviously impossible. You may argue, but I have too much respect for your judgment, Watson, to think that you will do so that the ring may have been taken before the man was killed. The fact that the candle had been lit only a short time shows that there had been no lengthy interview. Was Douglas, from what we hear of his fearless character, a man who would be likely to give up his wedding ring at such short notice? Or could we conceive of his giving it up at all? No, no, Watson. The assassin was alone with the dead man for some time with a lamp lit. Of that... I have no doubt at all. But the gunshot was apparently the cause of death. Therefore, the shot must have been fired some time earlier than we are told. But there could be no mistake about such a matter as that. We are in the presence, therefore, of a deliberate conspiracy upon the part of the two people who heard the gunshot, of the man Barker, and of the woman Douglas. When on the top of this I am able to show that the blood mark on the windowsill was deliberately placed there by Barker, in order to give a false clue to the police, you will admit that the case grows dark against him. Now, 
we have to ask ourselves at what hour the murder actually did occur. Up to half past ten, the servants were moving about the house, so it was certainly not before that time. At a quarter to eleven they had all gone to their rooms with the exception of Ames, who was in the pantry. I have been trying some experiments after you left us this afternoon, and I find that no noise which MacDonald can make in the study can penetrate to me in the pantry when the doors are all shut. It is otherwise, however, from the housekeeper's room. It is not so far down the corridor, and from it I could vaguely hear a voice when it was very loudly raised. The sound from a shotgun is to some extent muffled when the discharge is at very close range, as it undoubtedly was in this instance. It would not be very loud, and yet in the silence of the night it should have easily penetrated to Mrs. Allen's room. She is, as she has told us, somewhat deaf, but nonetheless she mentioned in her evidence that she did hear something like a door slamming half an hour before the alarm was given. Half an hour before the alarm was given would be a quarter to eleven. I have no doubt that what she heard was the report of the gun, and that this was the real instant of the murder. If this is so, we have now to determine what Barker and Mrs. Douglas, presuming that they are not the actual murderers, could have been doing from quarter to eleven, when the sound of the shot brought them down, until quarter past eleven, when they rang the bell and summoned the servants. What were they doing, and why did they not instantly give the alarm? That is the question which faces us, and when it has been answered we shall surely have gone some way to solve our problem. I am convinced myself, said I, that there is an understanding between those two people. She must be a heartless creature to sit laughing at some jest within a few hours of her husband's murder. Exactly. She does not shine as a wife even in her own account of what occurred. I am not a whole-souled admirer of womankind, as you are aware, Watson, but my experience of life has taught me that there are few wives, having any regard for their husbands, who would let any man's spoken word stand between them and that husband's dead body. Should I ever marry, Watson, I should hope to inspire my wife with some feeling which would prevent her from being walked off by a housekeeper when my corpse was lying within a few yards of her. It was badly stage-managed, for even the rawest investigators must be struck by the absence of the usual feminine ululation. If there had been nothing else, this incident alone would have suggested a prearranged conspiracy to my mind. You think, then, definitely, that Barker and Mrs. Douglas are guilty of the murder? There is an appalling directness about your questions, Watson, said Holmes, shaking his pipe at me. They come at me like bullets. If you put it that Mrs. Douglas and Barker know the truth about the murder, and are conspiring to conceal it, then I can give you a whole-souled answer. I am sure they do. But your more deadly proposition is not so clear. Let us for a moment consider the difficulties which stand in the way. We will suppose that this couple are united by the bonds of a guilty love, and that they have determined to get rid of the man who stands between them. It is a large supposition, for discreet inquiry among servants and others has failed to corroborate it in any way. On the contrary, there is a good deal of evidence that the Douglases were very attached to each other. That, I am sure, cannot be true, said I, thinking of the beautiful smiling face in the garden. Well, at least they gave that impression. However, we will suppose that they are an extraordinary astute couple, who deceive everyone upon this point, and conspire to murder the husband. He happens to be a man over whose head some danger hangs. We've only their word for that. Holmes looked thoughtful. I see, Watson. You are sketching out a theory by which everything they say from the beginning is false. According to your idea, there was never any hidden menace, or secret society, or valley of fear, or boss Mac somebody, or anything else. Well, that is a good sweeping generalization. Let us see what that brings to us. They invent this theory to account for the crime. They then play up to the idea by leaving this bicycle in the park as proof of the existence of some outsider. The stain on the window-sill conveys the same idea. 
So does the card on the body, which might have been prepared in the house. That all fits into your hypothesis, Watson. But now we come on the nasty, angular, uncompromising bits which won't slip into their places. Why a cut-off shotgun of all weapons, and an American one at that? How could they be so sure that the sound of it would not bring someone on to them? It's a mere chance, as it, that Mrs. Allen did not start out to inquire for the slamming door. Why did your guilty couple do all this, Watson? I confess I can't explain it. Then again, if a woman and her lover conspire to murder a husband, are they going to advertise their guilt by ostentatiously removing his wedding ring after his death? Does that strike you as very probable, Watson? No, it doesn't. And once again, if the thought of leaving a bicycle concealed outside had occurred to you, would it really have seemed worth doing, when the dullest detective would naturally say this is an obvious blind, as the bicycle is the first thing which the fugitive needed in order to make his escape? I can conceive of no explanation. And yet there should be no combination of events for which the wit of man cannot conceive an explanation. Simply as a mental exercise, without any assertion that it is true, let me indicate a possible line of thought. It is, I admit, mere imagination, but how often is imagination the mother of truth? We will suppose that there was a guilty secret, a really shameful secret, in the life of this man, Douglas. This leads to his murder by someone who is, we will suppose, an avenger, someone from outside. This avenger, for some reason, which I confess I am still at a loss to explain, took the dead man's wedding ring. The vendetta might conceivably date back to the man's first marriage, and the ring be taken for some such reason. Before this avenger got away, Barker and the wife had reached the room. The assassin convinced them that any attempt to arrest him would lead to the publication of some hideous scandal. They were converted to this idea and preferred to let him go. For this purpose they probably lowered the bridge, which can be done quite noiselessly, and then raised it again. He made his escape, and for some reason thought that he could do so more safely on foot than on the bicycle. He therefore left his machine where it would not be discovered until he had got safely away. So far we are within the bounds of possibility, are we not? Well, it's possible, no doubt, said I with some reserve. We have to remember, Watson, that whatever occurred is certainly something very extraordinary. Well, now, to continue our suppositious case, the couple, not necessarily a guilty couple, realize after the murderer is gone that they have placed themselves in a position in which it may be difficult for them to prove that they did not themselves either do the deed or connive at it. They rapidly and rather clumsily met the situation. The mark was put by Barker's blood-stained slipper upon the window-sill to suggest how the fugitive got away. They obviously were the two who must have heard the sound of the gun, so they gave the alarm exactly as they would have done, but a good half-hour after the event. And how do you propose to prove all this? Well, if there was an outsider, he may be traced and taken. That would be the most effective of all proofs. But if not, well, the resources of science are far from being exhausted. I think that an evening alone in that study would help me much. An evening alone? I propose to go up there presently. I have arranged it with the estimable Ames, who is by no means wholehearted about Barker. I shall sit in that room and see if its atmosphere brings me inspiration. I am a believer in the genius loci. You smile, friend Watson. Well, we shall see. By the way, you have that big umbrella of yours, have you not? It is here. Well, I'll borrow that, if I may. Certainly, but what a wretched weapon. If there's a danger... Nothing serious, my dear Watson, or I should certainly ask for your assistance. But I'll take the umbrella. At present I'm only awaiting the return of our colleagues from Tunbridge Wells, where they are at present engaged in trying for a likely owner of the bicycle. It was nightfall before Inspector MacDonald and White Mason came back from their expedition, and they arrived exultant, 
reporting a great advance in our investigation. Man, I'll admit that I had my doubts if there was ever an outsider, said MacDonald. But that's all past now. We've had the bicycle identified, and we have a description of our man, so that's a long step on our journey. It sounds to me like the beginning of the end, said Holmes. I'm sure I congratulate you both with all my heart. Well, I started from the fact that Mr. Douglas had seemed disturbed since the day before, when he'd been at Tunbridge Wells. It was at Tunbridge Wells, then, that he'd become conscious of some danger. It was clear, therefore, that if a man had come over with a bicycle, it was from Tunbridge Wells that he might be expected to have come. We took the bicycle over with us, and showed it at the hotels. It was identified at once by the manager of the Eagle Commercial as belonging to a man named Hargrave who had taken a room there two days before. His bicycle and a small valise were his all belongings. He had registered his name as coming from London, but had given no address. The valise was London-made, and the contents were British, but the man himself was undoubtedly an American. "'Well, well,' said Holmes gleefully, "'you have indeed done some solid work while I've been sitting spinning theories with my friend.' It's a lesson in being practical, Mr. Mack. Aye, it's just that, Mr. Holmes, said the inspector with satisfaction. But this may all fit in with your theories, I remarked. That may or may not be. But let us hear the end, Mr. Mack. Was there nothing to identify this man? So little that it was evident that he had carefully guarded himself against identification. There were no papers or letters and no marking upon the clothes. A cycle map of the county lay on his bedroom floor. He'd left the hotel after breakfast yesterday morning on his bicycle, and no more was heard of him until our inquiries. "'That's what puzzles me, Mr. Holmes,' said White Mason. "'If the fellow did not want the hue and cry raised over him, one would imagine that he would have returned and remained at the hotel as an inoffensive tourist. As it is, he must know that he will be reported to the police by the hotel manager, and that his disappearance will be connected with the murder. So one would imagine. Still, he has been justified of his wisdom up to date, at any rate, since he has not been taken. But his description, what of that? MacDonald referred to his notebook. Here we have it so far as they could give it. They don't seem to have taken every particular stock of him, but still the porter, the clerk, and the chambermaid are all agreed that this about covers the points. He was a man about five foot nine, in height, fifty or so years of age, his hair slightly grizzled, a greyish moustache, a curved nose, and a face which all of them described as fierce and forbidding. Well, bar the expression that might almost be a description of Douglas himself, said Holmes, he's just over fifty with grizzled hair and moustache, and about the same height. Did you get anything else? He was dressed in a heavy grey suit, with a reefer jacket, and he wore a short yellow overcoat and a soft cap. What about the shotgun? It is less than two feet long. It could very well have fitted into his valise. He could have carried it inside his overcoat without difficulty. And how do you consider that all this bears upon the general case? "'Well, Mr. Holmes,' said MacDonald, "'when we've got our man, "'and you may be sure that I had his description on the wires "'within five minutes of hearing it, "'we shall be better able to judge it. "'But even as it stands, we've surely gone a long way. "'We know that an American, calling himself Hargrave, "'came to Tunbridge Wells two days ago with bicycle and valise. "'In the latter was a sawed-off shotgun, "'so he came with a deliberate purpose of crime. "'Yesterday morning,' He set off for this place on his bicycle, with his gun concealed in his overcoat. No one saw him arrive, so far as we can learn, but he need not pass through the village to reach the park gates, and there are many cyclists upon the road. Presumably he at once concealed his cycle among the laurels where it was found, and possibly lurked there himself, with his eye on the house, waiting for Mr. Douglas to come out. The shotgun is a strange weapon to use inside a house, but he had intended to use it outside, and there it has very obvious advantages, as it would be impossible to miss with it, and the sound of shots is so common in an English spotting neighbourhood that no particular notice would be taken. That is all very clear, said Holmes. 
Well, Mr. Douglas did not appear. What was he to do next? He left his bicycle and approached the house in the twilight. He found the bridge down and no one about. He took his chance, intending, no doubt, to make some excuse if he met someone. He met no one. He slipped into the first room that he saw and concealed himself behind the curtain. Thence he could see that drawbridge go up, and he knew that his only escape was through the moat. He waited until quarter past eleven, when Mr. Douglas, upon his usual nightly round, came into the room. He shot him and escaped, as arranged. He was aware that the bicycle would be described by the hotel people and be a clue against him, so he left it there and made his way by some other means to London or to some safe hiding place which he'd already arranged. How's that, Mr. Holmes? Well, Mr. Mack, it is very good and very clear so far as it goes. That is your end of the story. My end is that the crime was committed half an hour earlier than reported, that Mrs. Douglas and Barker are both in a conspiracy to conceal something, that they aided the murderer's escape, or at least that they reached the room before he escaped, and that they fabricated evidence of his escape through the window, whereas in all probability they had themselves let him go by lowering the bridge. That's my reading of the first half. The two detectives shook their heads. Well, Mr. Holmes, if this is true, we only tumble out of one mystery into another, said the London inspector. And in some ways a worse one, added White Mason. The lady has never been in America in all her life. What possible connection could she have with an American assassin which would cause her to shelter him? I freely admit the difficulties, said Holmes. I propose to make a little investigation of my own tonight, and it is just possible that it may contribute something to the common cause. Can we help you, Mr. Holmes? No, no. Darkness and Dr. Watson's umbrella. My wants are simple. And Ames, the faithful Ames. No doubt he will stretch a point for me. All my lines of thought lead me back invariably to the one basic question. Why should an athletic man develop his frame upon so unnatural an instrument as a single dumbbell? It was late that night when Holmes returned from his solitary excursion. We slept in a double-bedded room, which was the best that the little country inn could do for us. I was already asleep when I was partly awakened by his entrance. "'Well, Holmes,' I murdered, "'have you found anything out?' He stood beside me in silence, his candle in his hand. Then the tall, lean figure inclined towards me. "'I say, Watson,' he whispered, "'would you be afraid to sleep in the same room with a lunatic, a man with softening of the brain, an idiot whose mind has lost its grip?' "'Not in the least,' I answered in astonishment. "'Ah, that's lucky,' he said, and not another word would he utter that night. End of chapter 6